Hello everybody, what's going on? Chris here, and today we're going to be talking about Mosaic's MPT-7B, which is a new foundational language model. Totally open source, totally commercially viable. So we're going to talk today about, you know, what makes this special, why it matters, and just get into it, right? So first of all, we have to look at a demo. We can ask it, what are some common misconceptions about birds? I didn't know specifically that there were common misconceptions about birds, but, uh, you know, having read this, I see that some people think all birds build nests. Apparently that's not true. Some people think all <laughs> birds are flightless, but the fact is that many species do fly and assuming that only small songbirds sing, uh, when in fact there's a wide variety of birds that vocalize. So I'm not going to lie to you, this nest one was a little bit, maybe not surprising, you know, cause penguins and stuff, but, or maybe they build nests. I'm not even sure. So you know, first things first, is this model state of the art? No. Once again, we're we're not here for the state of the art, right? We're not here to have a model that beats GPT-4. We're here to have a model that gets very close despite being a fraction of the size. So let's learn a little bit more about MPT-7B. First of all, uh, it is, you know, licensed for commercial use. So that means unlike the Llama counterpart, you can actually use this however you'd like uh, commercially. It's trained on a ton of data. One trillion tokens, in fact. Large language models are still firmly in the place of more tokens, more better. So this is a fantastic piece of news. Is it the be all end all? No, not really, right? So is the difference between 800 billion and a trillion going to be hugely impactful? not for most uh, tasks, you know, not for most domain applications, but it's awesome. You know, again, more tokens, more better. And it's leading us towards this place where we have these open source language models, which are trained on a gratuitous number of tokens, right? So that's always fantastic. So this bullet point is probably my favorite part in the whole blog post. It talks about how they can handle extremely long inputs thanks to Alibi. So if you know anything about traditional transformers, right? So if you've even just kind of glazed attention is all you need, Vaswani et al., right? This is the the paper of uh of our of our time basically. The way that the transformer knows anything about position is that that position is encoded into the input embedding, right? So there's another there's a positional embedding that is leveraged to show the model where the tokens are in the sequence. And that's that's crucial, right? We we can't just know what the tokens are. We have to know where they are in relation to each other, right? That is a powerful piece of the transformer mechanism. That's what lets it, despite not being a recurrent or convolutional network, that's what lets it have that information, right? Well, in this paper, we have this new idea, which is attention with linear biases or alibi. Uh, I believe it's pronounced alibi, though I, you know, I could be wrong. It might be Ali B, but you know, alibi sounds cool, so we're gonna stick with that. So first things first, they do away with positional embeddings. So there is no positional embeddings in the alibi method, right? Instead, they use this bias. So we have, and this is a very crude example, so it's not meant to be technically accurate. In any sense, just kind of showing a little bit behind the scenes of what's happening here. But the idea is that we still get our attention scores by calculating the dot product between the pairs of query vectors and key vectors. So we have here, you know, our attention scores are the dot product of Q1, K1, Q1, K2. It, again, this is not technically accurate, but it's just to build intuition. We grab those attention scores, which can be any, these whatever scalar values. Then we calculate an absolute distance. Now this is based on where they are in relation to each other. So when we look back at these vectors, you know, this is the first position, second position, third position, first position, second position, third position. So we can see here that this has the first position and the first position. So they're in the same spot. They're not distant from each other at all. So they have zero distance. And that's how we mark it here. If we go to this particular element, you can see that this is Q1 and K2, and they are distant from each other just by one, but they are distant from each other. 
And so we're going to go ahead and capture that information. We do that for every single value. And then we have some M, right? So our, our bias slope. And essentially what this is doing is it's just linearly biasing the attention scores based on this kind of pre-selected hard-coded bias slope, which is, it is not at all, so we can think of it as a slope because it's linear, right? We're just, we're again, we're fudging a little bit of the technicals here, but the idea is that we calculate based on the distance, some penalty, right? Uh, in this case, what we're talking about is we wind up with this particular bias matrix, right? So just another uh, 2D kind of structure. It's exactly the same as our attention scores. And then we penalize the attention scores by that bias, right? So you'll see here that in the zeroth element, we have no bias because the actual distance is zero, right? Again, if we go back to it, Q1 and K1 are in the same place. So no additional bias is applied here. If we go to Q2 and K1, right, that those are distant to each other by one. So we look in this, and indeed we find that it's one, right? So we have one times the bias, right? And this is the, the idea of it being linear, right? So that's why we're, we're calling it a slope. And in this situation, which is the would be the first query and the third key, right? We have a distance of two. So our total bias is going to be two times that slope, right? Again, where this is just linear. So we, we don't need to do anything else. And we get this penalty of 0 0.4. We then just apply our biases to our attention scores. We grab the attention scores and then like classic, get the soft max. And this is our new updated uh, attention score matrix. So there's a lot more technically going on in Alibi, right? So we have this idea that each of the layers is going to have different values for M or that slope, uh, bias slope. You know, we have this idea that we do still need to give it absolute positional information since we're talking about relative positional information in the example we talked about. But the idea is that the model gains like this preference or an inductive bias, right? So that's the, the technical term for more recent context. And what that means is when we feed it a huge chunk of information, it's more likely to understand or leverage that than it might be if we were talking about the traditional method of encoding positional information, which is those positional embeddings. So anyway, all this to say, it can handle big, long inputs, and that's huge for the open source model, right? It's different than, so that Claude can do 100K tokens is fantastic, but you have to go through Anthropic's API, right? Which is, by the, by the way, it's a fa fantastic API, but it isn't open sourced, right? So the fact that we have this open source LLM that's able to have such a wicked long context window is huge because again when we're talking about things like how do i train this on my own data right how do i add my own data to to the model things like just shoving your entire workplace manual into the context is it actually it's actually a great idea for the most part right so you don't have to partition or truncate or or otherwise reduce the context that you're giving the model. You don't necessarily have to just feed it bits and pieces of your context, right? You can shove a whole lot into that prompt and you're going to be able to have the model parse through all of it and it's going to pay attention to all of that context fairly well. So anyway, I'm not gonna go on about this anymore, but this is a huge step forward Alibi is not very old, but it's still like 2022. I mean, it's basically ancient history, right? But the, the way it's being leveraged here is just fantastic. They're also using flash attention and faster transformer. We're not going to go too into those. I've already taken up a lot of time talking about Alibi, but the idea is that these are faster or more efficient uh, training and inference 
applications. So we're, we're just able to train and infer that much quicker. And for open source, that's huge, right? When we increase the open source community's velocity, it's all upside. And it's equipped with highly efficient open source training code, which is, it's, it's like requirement at this, at this point, right? So what kinds of models are there? Well, we have the 7B base, which is a decoder style transformer with uh, a whole heck of a lot of parameters, train a 1 trillion tokens of text, and the uh, code that was, it was trained a 1 trillion tokens of text and code that was curated by Mosaic's uh, data team. The base model includes flash attention for fast training and inference, and alibi for fine tuning and extrapolation to long context lengths. The second model they've got is the Story Writer 65K plus. Uh, essentially, it was just built by fine tuning the base model with a context length of 65,000 token on a fit filtered fiction subset of the Books 3 data set. So basically, it's fine tuned on fiction books and it can generate up to 84,000 tokens on a single node of A180 gigabyte GPUs, which, it, which to be fair, is quite a lot of GPUs. You know, we're, we're not like, uh, it's not like this is going to run in collab, you know, but it's astonishing that this is open source. You can essentially type a prompt and get a book out. I mean, that's got to be pretty cool. You know, is this going to be something you run on your local machine? Doubtful. Uh, is it great that it's open source and out there? Yes. Fantastic. They also, of course, have an Instructune data set uh, derived from Databricks Dolly 15K and Anthropic's helpful and harmless data sets, which is pretty cool. Uh, again, this is a Creative Commons due to uh, Databricks Dolly 15K. And then they have a chat model, which is non-commercial, but still great. You know, it is, it is fantastic that they've released these open source models. Again, if you wanted a commercial chat model, you're totally free to fine tune this however you'd like with a data set that is commercially aligned. They've open sourced everything in this repo called LLM Foundry. Uh, it's got everything that you'd want. It's got the scripts, it's got the training scripts, it's got data, it's got the whole thing. Um, it's really just a fantastic resource. Please check it out if you are new to the uh, ML space. Mosaic seems to be positioning itself to be easy to use, so check them out. They do have this platform in which you can train these models. So it, if you're not used to using cloud service providers or you aren't, you know, or you're just getting started, you're able to sign up to the, their platform and potentially leverage uh, their resources and their, you know, all of the tools that they've built to help your LLM training process. This is just a fantastic graph, right? This just shows us that you know, MPT is kind of crushing it absolutely in terms of the uh, maximum input lengths. It even includes, this is GPT-4 32K. Listen, is the performance going to be the same? Definitely not. Does it matter? Also definitely not, right? Yes, GPT-4 is a very strong model, but it's huge and it's closed source. The, the cost to benefit is just not there uh, if you wanted to have a model that was as good as it in the wild, right? You'd be paying so much in compute costs anyway, They've already got it hosted for you. So this is where they put in the entire The Great Gatsby. Just insane. But the whole thing. And then they put epilogue. And they generated an epilogue. And that's fine. You know, there you go. So it does what it says on the tin, right? I mean, it's insane how long the context window is. That That's the big draw. It's crazy. So let's look at the actual training compute. They used... Uh, A140 gigabyte and A180 gigabyte GPUs from Oracle Cloud, MCLI, and Mosaic ML Platform for their orchestration fault tolerance. Data was handled by OCI Object Storage and Streaming Dataset, which is a Mosaic special. And then the software was Composer, PyTorch, FSDP, and LLM Foundry. Almost everything was spent on the MPT-7B model, which took about nine and a half days to train on 400 and 40 A100, 40 gigabyte GPUs. Insane. It cost them about $200,000, which is honestly not that bad, right? I mean, when we're talking about training these kinds of insane models, 200K isn't 
crazy. Uh, they fine tuned on kind of the classic uh, A A100 node for two and a half hours for the instruct tune model. The chat model was a total of 14.9 hours, cost them about 600 bucks, and they used a combination of a couple different nodes. And then the story writer on 32 80 gigabyte A100s took about two and a half days and cost them just north of 4K. This is just kind of like a big meme. Uh, this was their training logbook. As you can see, it's it's like it fits not just on the screen, but it fits kind of like on a very small part of the screen. They did a lot of work for it to be this way because they're training on, again, 440 A100s over nine and a half days, right? Uh, they, they basically set up their platform to automatically handle a lot of the frequent fail cases. And so they were able to handle it. No probs. This bit right here is probably my second favorite part of this whole blog post. It's insane, right? Like, uh, if you've had experience training larger models, sure. You're, you're not usually babysitting them 24 seven as they claim, but you do have to babysit them. There are loss spikes. I mean, when you look at the other open source models right now you see big loss spikes right in their in their training graphs but they were able to build software that would manage the process and make it you know just go beautifully that is a thousand and ten percent mlops this is why mlops is important right the fact that you can do this hands-off accelerates you so much all those engineers are no longer losing time on monitoring you know, you, you have confidence that you can just set it off and forget it and come back to a well-trained model. Huge. Here's the actual uh, training. You know what I mean? Very few spikes. We're talking over the course of the whole training. Nothing, nothing crazy. We can see there were hardware failures, automatic resumption, check marks the whole way down. Huge. Beautifully. Uh, I'm going to definitely look into mosaics platform in the future if you wanted to check it out in a video let me know this section is basically just singing the praise of good engineering good machine learning operations right the fact that there's no huge spikes through an intense train the fact that everything was automatically handled is it's just as important as the results that they obtained right so we are really entering an era in the open source community with you know closed source tooling or platform tooling that's going to let us do things we kind of only dreamt of uh, a year and a half ago right so huge props to the mosaic team this is incredible stuff you'll love to see it what's next for mosaic well of course more models more platform that's uh that's the way it's got to be right i need to stress again this technology is accelerating at such a fast pace and it's thanks to teams like mosaic hugging face red pajama all all of these you know open science big science you know <laughs> ultra science i'm sure must exist that we're able to see the things that we're seeing today i don't want to make this into an ad for mosaic but it's a fantastic platform so i can't wait to see what they do next I can't wait to enjoy what they've done now. I'm constantly shocked at how amazing the large language model community is, how much people are able to innovate and come out with just astonishing tools, platforms, models, and how we're able to leverage some of this tech that we had sitting around in this big pile that we're like, hey, I wonder if that works. I wonder if that works. It's all incredible. So stay tuned. Keep following the channel if you're excited to see more things like this. I will be doing some kind of deployment-focused content for the rest of the week. But thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, click the like button uh, and the subscribe button. And we'll see you in the next one.